Good morning. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Wolfgang Gorlick. He'll be presenting Naked Boulder Rolling. <laughs> you heard it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take it off. Am I live on the mic? All right, all right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, one other quick announcement I want to make is afterwards they're going to be doing the iPad drawing. So if you've got a business card you're going to throw in, throw in after the talk. Don't leave now. Um, and then they'll draw it out after we're done. And if you want to get a free hug, by uh, get up. Excellent. That's what I want. So today we're talking about information security management. Uh, but it will get more interesting than that. Don't worry. My name is Jay Wolfgang Gorlick. I am a security manager and a systems manager for a financial institution, an undisclosed financial institution. And I love that word undisclosed, right? Sort of like your superhero, you're flying around, you're like, no one recognizes me. Because who could possibly figure out, if I'm saying undisclosed, where I work? I think in this audience I'm pretty safe. No one could connect the knots. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just want to state for the record that I am here on my own behalf, not speaking for my employer. Do not, do not use naked boulder rolling for investment advice. <laughs> Very important. Uh, I tweet on jwgorlick.us if you want to send me any questions or troll me, as I'm assuming some people have already started doing. <laughs> And I also blog at jwgorlick.us on some of these topics we're going to be talking today in much more depth. And this is what a good friend of mine calls a NASCAR slide, all the things I'm involved with. Very pleased to be speaking here at B-Sides Detroit, and I'm one of the volunteers making this happen, so thank you all for participating and volunteering. I'm involved with the local Michigan Security Conference, the, the MISEC group. Um, ISOC, ISSA, I attend those from time to time, and members of that, co-founder of OWASP Detroit, one of the lead developers on SimWitty. I'm trying like all hell to get a CSA group in the area, so if anyone's interested in cloud security, tweet me, see me afterwards. And before I joined this undisclosed financial institution, I was a consultant. I love being a consultant. Consulting was a lot of fun. You know, there's a problem, right? You parachute in, you solve it, they give you a check, you run away, you put your glasses back on, they can't recognize you. I love being a consultant. A couple of things that consulting taught me as security, right, was that, hey, security is technology. It's the blinking box. Um, I want to check my passwords. I'll sell you an SSO. I'm concerned about data loss. I got a DLP system I will put in your office, no problem. So I learned a lot about security being technology. I learned security practices, right? You do the best practices, the right things in the right way, and the boogeyman won't get you. We're safe. I love that. And security is also project-based. As a consultant, what you do is you've got to call, yeah, we've got the system that's going live. Make it secure for us, because we've got to go live next week. No problem. We can do that. But of course, this mindset doesn't really work well as I jump from being a consultant into managing security. And I think we've all seen throughout B-Sides Detroit, there's been a lot of talk about people in inside jobs, people doing information security, the burnout, the stress, what have you. Because it can really pile up, right? I mean, if you're trying to maintain security, manage security uh, as technology practices and projects, that's a lot of work, a lot of effort, and you can really start to feel burned out. And I also think it has to do with how we think about security, right? So I'm going to give you a couple sentences and uh, raise your hands if you agree with this. The first one's pretty simple. It's not if a breach will occur, but when a breach will occur. Are we all pretty good on that, right? You know, it's not if, but when the bad guy really will get us, no matter how best your best practices are. Well, how about this one, though? We're all but one breach away from unemployment. Does everyone feel like that? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's not if, but when the bad guy will get us. It's not if, but when we'll get thrown under the bus for it and then have what uh, Len calls an RGE, right, a resume generating event. So you have a resume generating event, you get breached, you don't want that to happen, you're in a new job like I was when I joined this financial institution, you're like, I am not going to get breached, I'm not going to be a statistic, I'm going to be in this job five years from now, okay? So what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to secure everything, right? Because I know technology is security, I know practice is security, we've got projects, I can do projects, I was a consultant, I got this. Um, so you try and secure everything you have. And then it gets worse, right? Because, wait a minute, security as practices, what does that really mean? It means being hands-on, right? Being full in, full on, attending conferences like B-Sides Detroit, um, after the conference is going back, digging in the material, knowing your systems very intimately, knowing them inside and out. It comes from training and research, right? Like we're doing here. It comes from playing in the lab. It comes from building your sandcastle 
in the lab and then kicking it over and then taking what you learned and building a stronger sandcastle. And that's all fantastic stuff. And it worked great, I would imagine, if we had a mainframe that we're responsible for, or maybe a server, or maybe two servers and a firewall. We, we might get away with that. But there's just too much. There's too much today. And these stats come from the internet, and I was told as a manager the internet's always right. Uh, <laughs> And they also come from my personal experience. What I'm talking about is to a security professional, full-time security professional. They're like, yeah, look, I got like 5,000 devices to support, okay? All right, that sounds like a lot. Well, how about employees? Well, I got, you know, 1,000 employees who are doing who knows what all the time, and I'm supposed to keep them all safe. And, uh, okay, so do you have any support on IT? Well, not really. I got 20 IT people who are doing things, um, and that's great, but are they doing the right things? I don't really know when I ask them to do the right things, and I say, yeah, We'll do that, but it really does work better when everyone's administrator. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot going on. If you do the math, too, if you look at 5,000 devices, you say, I'm going to secure all systems. You know, I'm going to go all in. You say, I'm going to work 12 hours a day. I'm going to work 365 days a year. Who needs a vacation? I'm in security. We don't take vacations. That's for our conferences. And that counts as research, so that's OK. Um, if you do that math, you've got 5,000 devices, and you want to learn each one of those devices intimately. You do that math, it means that you get about one hour a year to spend with that device and make sure it's really secure. So you get one hour. It sounds great, right? In January, I spent an hour with that system. In, in December, that means it's still secure, right? So nothing changes. But we got a lot going on. we got a lot changing. And these actually are good stats because they come from McAfee. Woo! 2011, they saw 1,000 new malware forms appearing every single day. There's 100 new vulnerabilities appearing every single day, okay? And the news articles, what's going on in the world, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 of things we need to read. I did an experiment back in 2008 when I was starting to get stressed out, and I did an experiment. I took a vacation, uh, which was, was great. No, the experiment wasn't the vacation. The experiment was over a two-week vacation, I let all my news feeds pile up. Every single article, every single blog, every single email, let it all pile up, and I did statistical analysis and said, okay, if I read so many words a minute, how long would it take me to read all this? Okay, cool. So two weeks of reading would take me about a month. But all right, that doesn't really tell me much because what if I really wanted to understand it? You know, be full in, be hands on, secure all systems. I don't even really want to read this stuff. I actually want to play with it in the lab, make sure I understand what they're talking about. You know, I saw Jim Manico's talk and I thought that was awesome and I want to write some code to do that. Well, that takes a little bit longer. So I took two weeks and I spent day after day afterwards, you know, in between my normal duties, catching up and studying it and actually learning it and making sure I knew everything that happened. So two weeks snapshot, everything that happened, and I found an average that took me four days per day of new news. I, oh my God, no wonder why I'm stressed. Monday I'm four days behind. Tuesday I'm eight days behind. Seven, okay, thank you. Yeah, subtract the one. Thank you, we'll flight. <laughs> Yay, support from Chicago. <laughs> and by Wednesday, okay, subtract the one. I'm several days behind, and that's when you get the call. Yeah, secure the system because it's going into business right away. You just can't keep up, you can't catch up. And that's where I started thinking about information security as a Greek tragedy, right? If you think about a Greek tragedy, what do you got? You got three acts, okay? You got your CISO. I mean, no, you got your God who has brought in the hero who's going to do something, okay? So God's doing something, he's putting all his effort in, the, I'm sorry, the hero's doing something, he's putting all his effort in, day in and day out, he's working his hardest, and you know it's an if but when, by the third act, the bad guy's going to get him, he dies, he gouges out his eyes, whatever it may be. And that is security today. That's, I think, where a lot of people are, and that's where I felt like I was in 2008. Eye gouging. Eye gouging, thank you. Or, or Sisyphus, right? Eye gouging or Sisyphus with the boulder, you know, the guy with the boulder every morning, he rolled the boulder up. And then the guy put it back in the valley, and then he did it again. Which wouldn't be too bad if you only had one boulder, but the reality is, as information security professionals, we don't only have one system. We have hundreds of systems. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. I know you want to. So we got hundreds of systems that every day we're coming in, we're pushing up a mountain, right? Hundreds of systems that we come in, we get all our systems as secure as possible when they're on top of the hill, Nothing in the valley, if, if possible. Realistically, it's a spread. And what happens overnight? A thousand new pieces of malware. What happens overnight? A hundred new vulnerabilities. What happens overnight? Your email box is full and your RSS feeds are full with a whole bunch of tips and tricks and things you've got to do because they found new ways to kick over your sand castle. You come in the next morning, the boulder's back in the bottom of the hill, and you start it again. And you do it again and again and again. I first brought up this concept that I was thinking about 
about security as a Greek tragedy at uh, Gurkhan last year, at Gurkhan. And some people trolled me, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit. I'm not going to name names or point anyone out. I don't think it'd be right to troll the trolls. <laughs> it is possible you may be able to find them. Hi. Hi. And of course, Google's your friend if you want their personal information. And if you have any trouble with that, come see me. Uh, yeah, right. So one of the things that caught my attention was they're like, you know, in the business track over here, Gurkhan Wolfgang's telling us all about naked boulder rolling. Woohoo! I'm like, no, you guys don't get this. This is the Greek tragedy, right? You guys are the heroes, and the bad guys are going to get you. It's not if, but when. It's not naked boulder rolling. Come on. And they kept at it, and they kept at it, and a year later we're here, and they're still keeping at it. Um, <laughs> But, you know, at some point, called the Stockholm Syndrome or whatever, I kind of gave in. I'm like, you know, I can kind of see that. Okay, security is boulder rolling. I can, I can get that. I, I can get that. And besides, you know, defense is the new sexy. We're all talking about hack naked, thanks to Paul.com. So, all right, let's talk about defending. And what can we learn from security as naked boulder rolling? If we take this approach of security being naked boulder rolling, what can that tell us about why we're stressed? And how can we get out of this stress situation so we can do a better job? And of course, naked boulder rolling really covers if you're taking the project approach, if you're taking the technology approach, or if you're really focusing in on that from information security. It doesn't touch that other one, which I was talking about earlier, which as a consultant, you get hired to say, hey, something needs to be secure. Can you fix it? So in terms of projects, if you think about security as projects, well, when you're an internal guy, best case scenario, they call you and they say, this project's going in. And oh, you can take as long as you want to make sure it's right. And if you find anything, we'll kick it back to the vendor and they'll fix it, right? And then it goes in. That's like the best of the best case scenarios. Has anyone ever had that happen? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> More re realistically, what it is is, yeah, hi, security. It's Thursday, I know, but the system goes live on Friday. Oh, and yeah, they told the board and uh, the promotion material's going out Monday morning. So just do your security thing, just make it work. Right? Yeah, just your security thing. Make it work. Even if you get the best of the best possible situations, you put the system in place, what happens? Well, I've put this project in place. I saw this those times as a consultant. I put it in place in January. They had me back out in September. Why am I back out in September? Well, because it's been breached. Why has it been breached? It was secure when I put it in. Right? We have a time of check, time of use issue, right? Talk to it. Because you put it in securely, and then what happens? You've got those 20 administrators going, yeah, we've got to enable this functionality, and um, I can get it done if I make everyone administrator. So, <laughs> and, and what do you mean input validation? We just had to get this code written. So security as projects is too short, and it doesn't really fall under the naked boulder rolling. So I started thinking about how could we um, explain that. Jeff Rich is the chief risk officer at Layer Technologies, and Jeff Rich was on the White Rabbit podcast a while back. Real smart guy, and he said something I thought was pretty interesting, so I sort of stole his idea, but I am giving him credit. He said, look, you got a project, your business is full in on this project, they're putting in all the effort to make this project work. You got stakeholders, you got customers, you got vendors, you got people whose careers, <coughs> I don't even wanna know what's on Twitter right now. You have people whose careers are, are you know, tied to the success of this project. And right about the time the project is ready to launch, that's when they call you security and say, hey, yeah, hi, we got a project we're launching tomorrow, and uh, we're rolling the boulder off the cliff. Make sure that lands in the right spot, okay? Do your security thing. And that, to me, is security as projects, right? Security as projects is not only are we rolling boulders, but they're flipping, throwing them at us. <laughs> we are boulder catching. And then we wonder why we're stressed. So I started thinking, okay, if my mindset as a consultant is not working, what can I do to have a mindset shift to be a little more effective in delivering security. What can I do to understand a little bit better as an information security manager, and hopefully as one day a CISO, how to really do information security in a way that's making sense, that's having an impact, that means that I do get to get a couple of vacations once in a while, I can break away from the office to come to conferences like this. What needs to change? What I found was three main mindsets. One is security business alignment, another is risk management, the last one was life cycle management. For about the next half hour, I'm gonna go into each one of these three in a very, very quick pace. And then afterwards, I'm gonna round out the hour, look at my project du jour, and show you how this all comes together in a project I'm working on right now. First one is security business alignment, right? 
because when you go to your CFO and you say, look, I just need more blinking boxes, they make that sucking noise. That sounds like money. <laughs> if you're doing naked boulder rolling, you've gotten really good at the boulders. If you're a, a security consultant or a technologist, you've got really good at the technology. You know the technology inside and out. What may be missing is the hacking of layer eight, right? The carbon layer, PEB back. What's interesting is we don't even necessarily call them people anymore. But yeah, there's people at the end somewhere that are doing something. So what I thought was pretty cool was the concept of social engineering, your organization for your organization's own good. I don't necessarily mean lying to them, of course. It was kind of fun when we were doing the Rats and Rogues podcast. We had um, Dave Kennedy on, and we were doing the pre-talk. And Radis is a, is a little bit of a troll himself. He's like, so Kennedy, I hear you know we did a survey and social engineering is all about deception, right? <laughs> <laughs> Relic went on for about 10 minutes. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Only 10, because I said, oh, we're almost out of time. But um. <laughs> So yeah, I'm talking about leveraging people's skills. We had some great talks in social engineering. We got some more later on today if you want to catch them. But leveraging people's skills to make things happen. But not only that, but so, okay, people skills are fine and good, but what are you going to do with those people skills? In terms of social engineering 101, I mean, this is what most people think of social engineering, right? There's no patch for human stupidity. But I, I think we need to get beyond that. I think we need to look a little bit, um, a little bit up the ladder, what I call maybe a 200 level class, all right? Which is doing things like having a clear goal, speaking the language of the business, finding alignment, figuring out what your CFO wants. Now you can get him what he wants so you can get what you want. These are pretty simple things. There's a, a thing going on in Twitter and LinkedIn called SecBiz. Who here has on, been following SecBiz? Anyone okay? A few people? Great. It was actually a workshop for the first time ever. I don't know if you guys knew this, but it was great. First SecBiz workshop ever was at B-Sides Detroit yesterday, which was fantastic. We were pretty excited. Yes, thank you. And uh, it actually started with our two keynotes, Dave Kennedy and Raphael Lowe's, going at it over Memorial Day over Twitter. And of course, it, it grew from there. But the concept here is, how do we deal with the bifurcation, the growing bifurcation information security between aligning at the top with the people who are making management decisions and getting the buy-in and the sponsorship and the money and whatnot so that when you do the technical controls, you can do a good job. So in terms of a mindset suck biz, you're talking about hacking people first, right? You're talking about going to your business, talking about security, not saying, look, I was at B-Sides Detroit and uh, there's this really cool talk about an Apache vulnerability. We really should dig into that. Can I have some money? I want to do some death. You know, you're not going to get anywhere with that. One of the SecBiz concepts, again, this comes from Rafael Lose's uh, podcast, is the concept of talk about the trucks, right? So if you're in a trucking company, you talk about the trucks. I'm in a financial services company, I talk about the funds. I very rarely say, look, there's this real scary thing. We've got to do something. The Chinese are out to get us. Uh, it's usually more like, hey, how can we protect assets under management? How can we grow assets under management and do that in an IT security function? And that gets to aligning at the top, so we get that buy-in, and assigning at the bottom. The other thing that kind of tripped me up, and I think contributed to that whole, you know, secure all systems mindset, was as a security professional, I came in, I'm like, this is great. I'm here. Superman! I will do everything! And then my IT guys are like, well, what are you touching our stuff for? <laughs> and then pretty soon, they're like, don't tell Wolf anything, because he'll want to change it. So uh, signing at the bottom necessarily means you know, the people who know the technology the best are the ones you want to engage, involve with the security process, make them the advocates for the security team. Great conversation I had on that topic um, was with one of my software analysts and with a vendor. And okay, so if we're sending data, all right, and you're a security manager and you say, it needs to be encrypted, and they say, okay, no problem, we're gonna use end-to-end -end SSL for our web services. That sounds pretty good, right? That's, that sounds encrypted. So as a security manager, if you don't know the technology, I'm on the phone going, uh-huh, that's great, yay, let's do it. My software analyst, again, is sitting at the bottom, who's responsible for security. Everyone in my team has a security component. Um, I've got development rolling up to me and, and IT people rolling up to me. My software analyst pushed back. He's like, okay, that's great. You, got, you know, star for effort for web services. Uh, but do you realize once we do that web services call, you're sending us that file over FTP with a clear text password. Oh. I didn't know that. He did, which was good. The vendor's like, yeah, okay. So we went back and forth. Like, fine, we'll do SFTP. Great. My analyst was like, okay, that's good. But then we're not done. My analyst was going, well, what about PGP encrypting the file? No, wait a minute. We've got web services. We've got SSL. We've got SFTP now, thanks to you. What do you mean PG encrypt the file? What are, you, what are you guys doing with it? He's like, well, I don't know what you're doing with it on your server. Do you know what I'm doing with it on my server? Uh, okay, fine. We'll do that too. That sounds good. 
And those are the types of things that he caught because he's in it. He's the one who intimately knows it. He's the one who's spending the time with the system. As a security manager, I had no clue, no clue. I'm like, oh, yay, SSL, web services, sounds great. So by working with the team and getting them to do the work, it's much, much better. And that, in a, in a very rapid clip, is security business alignment. What is key about that is to begin building the reputation for someone who gets things done. Begin building the reputation with your security or your IT team and your developers that your, their efforts are valued and they have a stake in it. You know, begin building everything you need for the next two things. Next one being risk management. Risk management is all about keeping our jobs. Protecting the organization's ability to perform its mission, not just the IT assets. I love that, that comes from NIST 830, right? So risk management is all about saying, okay, we've got all this, these blinking boxes, they're great, what do they really mean? And what is the organization trying to accomplish? What are its goals? And focusing on that. Of course, the problem with that is that sounds great, right? All right, everyone go back and find out your tech stuff and just make sure it makes sense to the business. Go us. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. we've got 1,000 employees using hundreds of systems, right? Running on 5,000 devices with 20 IT people doing who knows what, who knows when, who knows why. Hopefully in a secure fashion, right, if you, if you started doing the alignment. Um, more likely just because they gotta get it done real quick. And it really begs the ultimate question at this point. If you're talking about prioritizing, the question is, the hell does all this stuff do? I got this blinky box, it looks great, it's got connectivity, my backup guy says he's, he's uh, you know, backing it up, I've got SSL to it, yay! But what does it really mean to the overall organization? That's really the question that we've got to answer. So again, looking at social engineering for some guidance, having a clear goal. The clear goal, I think, needs to be asset identification, business process identification, having the business talk to you about what your goals are. What I thought was interesting was, um, in the, Sec Biz Workshop, some people, we had, we were, you know, find out what your organization's goals are and how they map to IT. Some people are like, uh, yeah, we asked and they told us that's none of our business. <laughs> oh, that hurts. So how do we get executive sponsorship to ask those questions, to get the business units to uh, spend some time with us and get things done? And the way I was able to do this was by leveraging business continuity. In my organization, circa 2008, 2009, it was, well, okay, there's fire can get us. That would be bad. Asteroids, if an asteroid strikes and levels our data center into a smoking crater, that would be bad. How do we keep in business? And don't tell me about all this hacker stuff, because every time you do that, you want to buy a blinking box. But let's figure out, <laughs> no, you know, you know how this goes. Let's figure out what we can do to continue operating in the face of a natural disaster. So I'm like, great, I can do that. Woohoo! let's do business continuity. And business continuity is one of the 10 domains of information security, so for all the CISPs, we get a star on our forehead. Uh, it's something you never ever hear at an information security conference unless you get Rick rolled by looking at naked boulder rolling. I wonder what that's about. Oh, it's business continuity. But this is quick, I promise. Uh, one of the things I like about business continuity as a solution domain is it abstracts things very nicely, okay? In terms of rolling boulders, when I first started on this process, I'm like, look, no, no, really, it matters if it's a Dell, HP, or an IBM server, and it matters if it's Windows or Linux, and if it's Linux, it matters what kernel it is, and that's capture all that documentation, and, that's, and then you get this big, huge book, and you're like, look, guys, we wanna go through this with the business, and then no one attends your meetings anymore, <laughs> which is bad. So I like that business continuity keeps it very high level. Technology, application, connectivity. Here's an example from one of our maps. We got a couple servers that are delivering a couple applications. They need a data center. Those applications are being used by research and client services. Okay, fantastic. What does client services mean to the business? What does research mean to the business? Rather than what does a blinking box mean? Because we can map everything up. And once we know that, once we've got that mapping, we can then begin to look at uh, impact analysis, right? So if things are actually down, if there is a smoking crater, what does it really mean? I use a very simple uh, four by three matrix, which is app down, server down, site down, communication down, same day, short term, long term. I promise you I go through these quickly because I won't talk too much about business impact or business continuity. What is important is business impact, which is to say, if you know what you have and you know what business function is supporting, you can begin to ask the very simple question. What monetary value does the organization place on that and what strategic value does organization place on that? 
in terms of, of upside, right? Are we making money with it? Is it a lot of money or a little money? In terms of downside, if it's down, are we getting fines? Are we breaching our SLA? Things of that nature. So impact analysis is great because it begins to prioritize things. Anyone want to go through a? No, probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, you guys got to come to a MySec meeting. Plus, you're trolling me. I don't listen to you. Uh, <laughs> The key insight that I loved from business continuity, and it was, it was like a, you know, a mirage in the desert as I was lurching towards it, is this right here, which is a disaster recovery budget must not exceed the value of the assets it protects. But differently, we shouldn't spend more time on things than what they really matter to the organization through a business process <coughs> to the overall company. And I love that concept. And in, in the past, if you're trying to boulder roll, you don't know what anything means. All you know is you've got to roll as many boulders up before you go home, go to sleep, and everything's back in the valley. But if you can start to say, okay, what does any of this stuff really do? Which ones are important? You can start to make better decisions. Business continuity is a very easy way to do that. Of course, business continuity is only acts of God, right? The asteroid didn't purposely aim for you. The fire didn't purposely burn your building alone. The flood didn't just hit your server and leave the rest of the building. Unfortunately, security, as we know, that's almost never the case. It's usually people who are out to get you. So what happens when you do get breached, not if, but when, what happens if you do get breached? How can you make sure when you get breached, it's in a way the organization continues, and more importantly to you personally probably, that your career continues, and that you don't get thrown under the bus as the security guy who lets something bad happen? So we started looking at risk management to do that. Risk management, similar to business continuity, but only instead of just looking at availability, we start looking at confidentiality, integrity, it's also one of the top 10 domains. Two stars, CISPs, for stacking up the CPEs. It's a fantastic thing. <laughs> and when you prioritize your assets, it's not only in terms of business continuity about just what it's doing, but it's also things like, hey, what compliance issues may occur. I'm in financial services. That's a big one for me. What vulnerabilities may occur. If you listened to Derek Thomas's talk yesterday, you know about all the vulnerability management side of it. And, uh, you know, what are your threat agents? Again, natural disasters aren't aiming for you, but the bad guys are. You know, your, your competition, your internal threat, your hacktivists. As a quick aside, why is it that hacktivists always want to go after Sony and financials? Leave Sony, well, you can keep being on Sony, but leave us alone. <laughs> Ice cream places, great, if you're watching us on the stream. Pet shops, no. You know, just pick some other one other than financials. What? <laughs> All right, don't hurt the puppies. But any industry other than mine is good. Pick, roll the dice, get like one of those, you know, D&D &D dice. Are you naked while doing that thing? <laughs> you are, sir, and do not post pictures. <laughs> so, yeah, naked dice rolling. That's my next talk, apparently. Uh, and it will include business continuity for, for you guys to win. So bad guys and bad things they can do to you. And of course, your vulnerability management. Now, Earlier, when I started, I mentioned I was taking, you know, that security is technology, trying to touch everything and know everything inside and out, and it drove me nuts. And I'm not talking about that when I'm talking about vulnerability management. What I like about vulnerability assessments is it's something you can do in the afternoon. It's something that can point you in the right direction. It does exactly what I need to do, which is tell me where my weak links are in the chain, right? Tell me where my links, weak links are there, so I can focus my time on those. And then we can begin to determine, okay, those are my weak links, there's my assets, what do they really mean? And there's some great things to do about, to do that. For NIST 830, you're looking at things like what generates the most revenue or profit. I like that from an IT operations side because I can say, I enable the business, how? By spending your money on blinking boxes. That never goes over well with my CFO. I can say, I enable the business because this technology that you're paying 100,000 for drove a million dollars in revenue last year. That is a great conversation to have. And you can do that with risk management. Uh, ISO 2705 looks at things like loss of customer confidence, your reputational impacts, and a lot of people are very concerned about that. Or FAIR, which things like uh, your loss of productivity and whatnot. So you look at one or more of these domains or a blend thereof, and you begin to figure out what really is important to the organization's mission. What's really important to the organization meeting its quarterly annual goals? And that technology is fine. Now, of those technologies, what really is got some known issues? Okay, those are the boulders we want to focus on. And again, the corollary to business continuity with risk management is the cost of security 
must not exceed the value of assets of Press X. Put differently, don't spend any more time on it than it really matters. I mean, if, you, if it's a small boulder down here, don't roll it all the way up to the hill so you can feel good at the end of the day, which I've done. <laughs> don't do that. So and then you can take a risk-based approach. I love a risk-based approach. When I'm in my organization and we're in a meeting with the higher-ups and they say, you know, I don't think we need to do all this work. We can take a risk-based approach. That's great. That's like, okay, my list went from 100 things down to 10. Score. Because what's interesting is, you know, the whole Pareto chart, right, which is 20% of your stuff delivers 80% of your value. Most of your stuff doesn't really do much. I mean, it's necessary evil. So if we can prioritize our efforts, we can limit down the amount of stuff we need to worry about. And, of course, then we can begin to remediate. From a security perspective, remediating after the fact is always painful. And I'll get to that when I start talking about naked boulder catching. But when we're boulder rolling, of course, you remediate. What's that do? That breaks stuff. And now you've got to talk to your ops guy and say, yeah, I broke that. Or me, I'm in a, I'm a dual role, so I close the door and I yell at myself. <laughs> is that all you do? Yes. <laughs> in this slide, yes. So <laughs> is that all I do? Ay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a tough crowd. So, no, so you want to remediate. When you fix things with security controls, you're going to break things, and then you get back into that bad reputation of the security guy who breaks things, right? And if only we don't tell him about it, he won't break our stuff. So that's really the key thing is to do lots of communication, prepare people, break it at the right time, um, et cetera. So that's a real rapid pace look at risk management. I think risk management is one of the key ways, if you shift your mindset, to be more effective in security. You just lost a CPE, mister. <laughs> <laughs> Turn in your badge. I would argue that business continuity and risk management is the new peanut butter and jelly. Why? Because they go together well. There's a lot of complementary uh, information there. If you're in a mixed role like me, you can perhaps leverage your business continuity efforts downstream. If you're not, you need to talk with your um, operations guy because he probably has a lot of this information about what this stuff really means that you can use in your risk management probably. In my case, I called this the falling asteroids hack because I leveraged the concern that literally they said, well, what if an asteroid hits us? So, okay, it's a falling asteroid attack. Let's talk about that. What was curious to me is that risk management means a whole new thing to financial companies. I did not know that. Hey, we need to do risk management. Why? We got a whole floor of PhDs who do that and they're quants. Okay, so risk management <laughs> did not go over well in terms of IT uh, controls with my management team. Business continuity is something else. So for me, that was a way in. For you, that may be the same, or you may find your own way in. Again, it's all about leveraging social engineering. Once you do that, once you can get out of boulder rolling and see the hill for the boulders, if it were, the forest for the trees, what have you, you can again looking at the overall security posture. Overall security posture is very simple. It says, look, I got my most important boulders at the top. Even if you got the same number of boulders, same number of systems, and if you got the same distribution between the ones that are pretty weak and ready to be popped off by hacktivists and the ones that are tight and secure and, you know, rogue states would, would be needed to get into them, uh, if you got the right distribution between what's important to your organization and what's not, you're not going to get hit by the bus, right? Yeah, we got hacked and we caught that and we remediated it. Here's my report. It's a much better conversation. Oh, and it meant nothing to your organization. Just letting you know, FYI. Also means rolling fewer boulders farther. If you're trying to spend brute force all these systems and you only get an hour every year with them, you're not going to get very far in terms of securing them anyways. But if you can spend 20, 30 hours of your week focusing on the areas that mean the most to your organization and then spend the rest of your week doing other things, you're going to be in a much better spot. And you can use that time for other things such as life cycle management, which we'll talk about next. So in terms of boulder rolling, right, your technology, your security's technology, your security's practices, that's covered by risk management. In terms of boulder catching, right, they're throwing things at you. Hey, it's Thursday, but the project's got to go live, like, right now. That's where life cycle management comes in. Life cycle management is all about baking security controls into the entire process. It, the word slide, so right, hold on. I yeah. did that intentionally. See, so we got a... Get hungry, get more hungry, and, and wait, no, it gets worse. So if you imagine a bakery, okay, this bakery, and you've got these great smells, and you've got a 1,000 employees, I mean, a 1,000 customers, right, who are depending on you, 
and you've got 20 bakers who are all hard at work, right? And you've got one security professional. Would it make any sense if you told that security guy, look, we're going to bake the bread, and like five minutes before it's due to the customer, you had the flour. Yeah, that would taste real good. How do you make bread with sugar, though? <laughs> with flour. Make it disgusting. Just put a flour. You would, you would never, ever, ever add flour after the fact in the baking process. You just wouldn't do it. It doesn't make sense. But for some reason, we as an industry seem to think, oh, we just add security after the fact. And actually, we had one of the, the people here out at B-Sides, right, who had a, a tweet on this just last week. They had a, a message from the project manager. It's like, oh, yeah, got a message from the project manager. We don't do security. Your job is to add security when the project's done. Ouch. But that's common. Everyone knows that. We see that all the time. So what can we do to get out of that? Well, the way we do it in our team is we do, we slice a project up this way. 20% of the time in the budget goes to preparation, design, training. That's analogous to your, your boulder rolling, right? You're really getting deep in the system. Instead of the security guy doing that, it's the actual people doing the work doing that. And that's pretty key because if you look at Verizon's threat report, if you look at any of these threat reports that come out, people are not getting popped and people are not getting fired because of something scary that happened, you know, that they heard about at a B-Sides conference. It's usually, yeah, the IT guy put that on the DMZ and wanted people to get access to it, so he just dropped the firewall, you know? Or give everyone admin access, things are great. These are usually typical configuration issues that if people are responsible, educated, trained, and uh, measured in terms of performance on security would not happen. So we had preparation up front. We spend 70% of the time implementing. Most businesses, when they think of our project, that's all they think about is implementation, right? We hired someone in, they did it, it's done. Well, there's prep work, there's work after. And then we have security. 10% of every project budget, every 10% 10, 10 of every effort that we go through minimum is dedicated to security. But that's not after the fact, even though that's what it looks like in the slide. That's integrated, baked in throughout the entire process. And I'll show you guys what that looks like in terms of workflow. This gets back to my assigned responsibility at the bottom, aligned deliverables at the top. The best quote I ever got, best compliment I personally think I ever got as a manager came about a couple months back when I was preparing for, uh, for a DevOps interview. I'm like, well, what, what do you think has really changed from how you used to do work when we had you know, different management structure to how we do work today when you report to me? He said, the number one thing that's changed, the number one thing that's different is I now have the time, the resources, and the support to do a good job. And I love that, to do a good job. And that's not just, yeah, I came in, I did a good job, yay me, but it's more about doing things in a rugged approach, right? So that if things get attacked, if something breaks, something goes wrong, if there's bad inputs, the user has done something amiss, that the system stays up and stays operational. To do that, of course, you gotta have good alignment at the top. I know that goes all the way back to the beginning with social engineering. You have to make sure from the CEO on down that you've got the support to implement this. This gets back to the rugged software manifesto. Has anyone looked at this? Anyone? Oh, come on now, guys. No one, really? Is there? No, no one. Oh, well, are you just being nice or you're trolling me? Oh, OK. I never know with you. <laughs> so I got the URL up there. Check it out. Josh Corman is one of the lead guys on this. He's worked on this. What I like about the rugged software approach is they've got a, a whole manifesto and they're working on, like a, I think, a 60-page operation book for DevOps teams. So from a developer perspective, all the things we listened to with Jim Monaco this morning at his keynote, it's like, well, how do you instill that in the developers so that when they're making code, it's coming out the right way? And my team uses this rugged software manifesto because it gets you, you know, it's, it's good. What I do, I built stuff good, built it rugged. It can withstand anything. From a social engineering perspective, what do we need to do to, uh, to do life cycle management? Again, it's all about getting the sponsorship up top to do this. It's all about making sure security is in scope. If you think about the project management triangle, right, scope, time, budget. If you got security in scope from the beginning, that means what? Time and budget for training for your, your team, your developers, yourself. Security is in scope, that means time and budget for internal security review. If security is in scope, that means time and budget is available for external review, for pen tests, for red teaming it. So it's vital that we get that out of the gate. In terms of the SDLC training, this is just a standard waterfall model. Training, as we already talked about, is 20%, doing it right. 
requirements is all about from the time you do it, the business case on down, we're communicating with the business in the way that makes sense to them, talk about the trucks, talk about the funds, so they know that security is going to be a component of the overall quality of the system. When you design it, it's baking the security controls, doing your threat modeling. Really? And I am skipping ahead really quickly. <laughs> And when it's all done, you put it in place and you integrate it with what I talked about earlier, which is business continuity by impact analysis, your risk management process, right? Maintaining the vulnerabilities and maintaining the configuration. The key here is, in terms of security projects, in terms of naked boulder catching, is to have a process that when systems go in place, you've gotten way ahead of the boulder so that you can do everything you can to make sure that it's secure, it lands in the right spot in the hill, you're in a good position then to maintain it over time and maintain that security as close to the desired state as possible. Put differently, that means, you know, boulders have a controlled landing, right? They go where we want them to go. Those are really the three main things that uh, I had a mindset shift on starting in 2008. And now I approach security entirely differently from a management perspective. One example that a case in point is, uh, is a system, a project I'm working on right now. Before I go into this, I'm going to say, ask your doctor if SDL is right for you. Now, everyone likes to argue, especially some of the people up here in front. Uh, so go ahead, argue with me. That's fine. I oftentimes call these Coke or Pepsi questions because they're like, oh, you know, I, I picture people with their Coke bottle coming up to me with their Pepsi bottle going, you need to drink Coke. If only you had bought product X, things would work great. So go ahead, argue with me. That's fine. Don't be surprised if I don't tell you right because there's multiple ways of doing this. Uh, and it's funny, too, I, I put on Twitter, I'm like, you know, it's a Coke or Pepsi question. Instantly, Secure Julio, no, it's RC Cola, man. <laughs> You've been doing it wrong. Like, oh, ouch. Scott Thomas, follow him. He's got a good career ahead of him as an InfoSec pundit, I can tell. So my case in point, my case in point is a website. My website has this lovely nugget on it. The website says, site optimized for IE5 with 800 by 600 resolution. <laughs> Yes, most excellent. That's like a big sign saying, hey, hacktivists, come get me. I'm a financial. <laughs> I, I hope you all appreciate, too, the, the attention that I went through to actually find IE5 and screenshot this. <laughs> but I, I do kind of like that because it makes me nostalgic, you know, for happier times, simpler times, when you didn't have all these web browsers I couldn't pronounce, um, people weren't carrying around. What's a tablet? I don't know. Uh, back when you could tell your client, run this resolution, this browser, that's a great thing. But of course, what comes out must come down, and sometimes when it comes down, it comes down hard, which always reminds me of the $6 million man. Crash, there goes our website, but don't worry, we can rebuild it. We have the technology. So we started a project to rebuild a website. <laughs> but if Steve Austin reported to my firm, he would get like the bionic leg and the walker. So do, do, it, do it affordable, okay, Wolf? All right, we can do that, we can do that. Or like a wooden peg. Or a wooden peg, yes. Yeah, thank you, sir. McCain. So again, through the SDLC process and the requirements phase, we knew right away that we had to have this website secure. People are going to try and tear this poster down, right? So we had to have this website come in secure. So from the business case to the RFP to the final signed statement of work, we and made sure that security was included. Why? So we have the time and the budget to do security. But we didn't do it by saying, look, guys, uh, did you see Jim Monaco's talk? I can send you the link. There's some really scary stuff you can do with cross-site scripting which would have worked great for my developers, and they would have yay, rugged, but it doesn't work well with my business units. So we talked about the funds. We talked about protecting assets under management. We talked about growing assets under management. We talked about holding the vendor who's writing this code accountable. We're paying them an ungodly amount of money. They better be writing high-quality code. Well, how do you know if it's high-quality? Well, I'll tell you. We'll bring in a company who will test the quality of the code. Ah, okay, let's do it. We also got a letter of testation as part of the RFP process on their SDLC. How are they running soft, secure development? Are they following a secure development lifecycle process? And if they're not, I don't want you working on my stuff. And we got, which was key, a letter saying we will build in controls to address the OWASP top 10. We'll address the OWASP top 10. And if it's not addressed and we've got to fix it, that's on us. Why? Because that's outside the scope. We didn't do something right, which is fantastic. And we got a budget to bring in a third party to do code review and to do system testing. And we did that all front, well before the boulder was even, you know, a real boulder, well in the process of just writing the business case. And then we did the impact analysis. What's really going to happen to the system when it goes live? Obviously, confidentiality, not so really important. This is a public website. 
Availability, pretty important on a day-to-day -day basis. We need it up. If we're in a DR scenario, probably not so important because it's not tied to a key business process. So it's important for the overall organization's you know, six-month, 12-month mission. Um, but overall, it can be down a little bit without costing us too much money, which is good. So we found our DR tier. We found our confidentiality tier. Then we got to integrity. With respect to assets under management, even though we got a website that's completely separate in every meaningful way from a trading system, if that thing got breached and popped by hacktivists and there's a picture of a boat or whoever on it, the obvious question is going to be, wait, why? Who, am I investing with these people? <laughs> do, I, do I trust them? Hmm? Why a boat? Why a boat? Wikiboat, oh, lolcats. No, not Wikiboat, lolcats. There you go. We'll get attacked. So we, we went and we made sure that we followed a very rugged process to make sure that we had a high degree of integrity. And one of the meetings we had, and, and I really enjoyed it, I had, was my software developer and their software developer, and they're staring eye to eye. And I felt like I was sort of like watching like some sort of, you know, Clint Eastwood movie. And I was like, oh, this is going to be bad. And their guys are like, look, we don't need to do input validation. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Well, you're giving us the data. We trust you. That should be your responsibility, right? <laughs> no. And my guy's like, look, we need to do this project right. And what's going to happen is, I don't know how, but sometime next year, we're going to send you bad data. I don't know how. I don't know why. But it's a given that sometime next year, we're going to have an operational concern. We're going to have a security concern. We're going to have whatever it may be. And you're going to get bad data. On a good day, 364 days a year, you're going to get good data. That will be tens of workflows that people will process through their normal efforts which would be great, fantastic, no effort needed from IS. On that one bad day, you're talking about potentially thousands of workflows. Each one then needs to be manually checked. The normal process that the business is following needs to be put on hold. The IS team needs to be pulled off whatever teams there, are, and we're going to have one to two very long days, followed probably by some unpleasant meetings. You absolutely positively need to do input validation. And again, I go back to rugged DevOps. That's just the way now my team thinks, right? Things are going to go wrong. Let's bake it in early on so when things go wrong, the business doesn't notice, and I don't need to be up all night. And I think that's critical, critical in the design phase. We also kicked the documents, the final design documents, over a third party. We reviewed them internally, kicked them over a third party to make sure we didn't miss anything. We actually did miss a couple of things, so it was a very valuable exercise. Some of the controls they felt were pretty weak for the OWASP top 10, so we strengthened that before it went into production. On the ops side, I am using Windows, so like I said, Coke or Pepsi me. But uh, we're using a hardened Windows. Uh, we have a true multi-tier infrastructure with different segments on the network. We're encrypting everything wherever possible. We got IPS on the uplinks. And once we got all that design again, we reviewed it internally, meaning I reviewed it after my team designed it. And then I kicked it over to third party and they reviewed it. So we have a high level of uh, attestation on the ops side. And then we started implementing, OK? So in implementing, we're using Microsoft um, SDL process, which is free. We're downloading. It's got a whole bunch of templates. It helps us out. Spec includes the security controls, which is key. So they're building the controls in. Some of the things that Jim Monaco talked about earlier today are in from the ground up. Uh, so they tell us to make sure that it actually is in. We've got a third party again doing code review at 50%, 75%, and then 100%. They do code review, and then they attack it. And also, I should state, it's not just code review as you know, separate from the business. It's part of the UAT and RFP. So we do functional testing. We do security testing. And if it doesn't pass both, guess what? You're not getting paid, and you're going back and finishing it, which I think is critical to hold your vendors accountable to make sure they're actually producing high-quality stuff. On the ops side, we're using automated process. We've got uh, System Center Configuration Manager to do that. I'm looking at using the PTES for the first time for our penetration test, which is all good and fun stuff. As a pro tip, when you get your penetration tester coming in, right, you really want someone with in the trenches knowledge. You want someone who's you know, got, that, uh, got that real world experience, someone who's come up from the ranks, someone who walks in and your team is already scared, or they hear he's coming, and they harden the firewalls before they come in. So it's, <laughs> it's vital you get someone who really knows their stuff. It was funny. I actually put this on when I was working on my deck, and my, uh, my storage guy walked in. He saw it on my monitor. He's like, hey, Wolf, I'd like to talk to you about Oh, my God! <laughs> he goes, who is that? I go, that's the guy who's going to be teching your shit. You better do a good job. He goes, is he going to be that dirty when he comes? 
50 50? So, so yeah, we, do, we're, we are going to be pen testing the, the infrastructure set up now. We're going to be starting that in the next couple of weeks. And then TBD, because as, as I mentioned, this project is, is in process. We're going to be integrating it in with our ITGRC pack. I'm using Service Manager from that from Microsoft. Again, there's many ways to do it. But I found that one's pretty easy for me, and it saved me a bunch of money switching off the old ITGRC system I was using. We're integrating it in with our threat management gateway, so we got response, alerts, everything we need. So that, again, it's not if, but when, but when I get an alert, I can respond very quickly, address the integrity of the site very quickly, and move on. And eventually, we'll be able to retire this thing. Hopefully, before I get a slide that is as antiquated as IE5 with 800 by 600, hopefully. Otherwise, I'll have another talk. And, and that's really an example of what I mean by uh, security development lifecycle has uh, means boulders have a control landing, right? Because from the start of the process all the way to when that boulder is on the field and we're now maintaining it rolling up the hill, every single step of the way, we are doing everything possible we can to make sure it's, it's tight, it's got the right controls, we've addressed the threats, we're doing it in a very high quality, rugged fashion. And that's also what I mean by risk management means rolling fewer boulders farther. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time looking at aspects of the system that aren't necessarily tied to the organization's mission and aren't necessarily going to impact the organization should they occur. And again, that's in this particular instance, things like availability in a DR scenario. So that is your boulder rolling. And as a quick wrap up, I'll wrap up real quick. I know we're just about, or actually we are out of time. Quick. What I found going in from a security position, being hands on as a consultant to a security manager position, is that I was getting way worn out, right? Because boulder rolling will wear you down. Every morning you come in, you roll as many boulders up, the next day they're all back in the hill and you do it again and again and again. And while you're doing that, they're throwing new boulders at you, which makes it fun. So boulder catching will flatten you because there's invariably you're gonna get that call on Thursday. Yeah, fix this by Friday, it's going live. You didn't fix it, it goes live. Next week there's a security incident, now you're to blank. So you gotta get out of, I feel, we gotta get out of that type of mentality. I think it's better to focus in on the organization and its ability to perform its mission, which is this real high level lofty goal, which I feel that we can get to that by using things like business continuity impact analysis. So we should be able to look at any blinking box in our environment. Actually, my team has knowledge sharing meetings where we talk about this. That blinking box means this to the business, which means this to our six month or 12 month goals. Part of that is social engineering using just good old fashioned people hacking skills in a legitimate ethical way so that your team has what they need, so that you have what you need, so your team knows what they're doing, so they've got the resources to train, and so at the end of the day you can have a very resilient high quality system. Gets back to risk management and business continuity being the new peanut butter and jelly, SDLC being the new bread, yes it's lunchtime, get hungry. Uh, impact analysis, smarter boulder rolling, life cycle is smarter boulder catching. That's really all I have. I want to thank everyone for coming out here. I hope you're having a great piece at Detroit. I also want to give a